scripture. I ask you to stand and honor God's word. If you have your Bibles, you know I always hope you do. Just follow along. Ask if Thomas might share, read with you in 2 Peter 1, 3 to 11. Second Peter 1, verse 2. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, <clears throat> they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them and is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble and you'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God's word, you may be seated. Seven qualities or characteristics for a godly life. If you, if you notice in the beginning here, he uses a couple words that we're going to emphasize throughout the message. He says, make every effort. Make every effort. And then down further in verse 8, he says, in increasing measure. And then down at the end again in verse 10, he says again, make every effort. Make every effort to add these things to your life. Now, you know, those are words and adjectives, they're active. Adding something is, is an active thing. Uh, making increasing is an active thing. All these things are something that we need to work on to continue to do in our lives that we might have a, a godly life. Their qualities, it, it's what he's talking about is a level of excellence in our Christian life and our Christian journey. Now, true faith is precious, amen? And true faith always wants to improve on our spiritual life. Is that not true? True faith is not only precious to us, but if we have a true faith, it is wanting us then, it, and inside of us is to improve on our spiritual life and our spiritual journey. And so in these scriptures, he talks about that. In fact, in verse three again, he says, his divine power, has given, he's given us everything for a godly life, everything. And then he says, and through these, you have great promises. And so because he gives us everything to have a godly life, we have all these promises that God has given us, promises that he will forgive our sins, promises he'll save us, promises us that there's a heaven for us to gain and a hell to shun, all these promises that he'll help us in our journey and our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Giving us all these promises. And it's true, the scripture says, the knowledge of him. And then in verse 5, it says this again. So make every effort to add to your faith these things. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of make every effort, he's not talking about something passive. He's not talking about, okay, well, maybe it won't matter. Well, I'm just going to kind of go along in my journey. When he says make every effort, he's talking about work, strength, going, doing, adding. Effort is something that's not always pleasant. I, I don't know if some of you uh, have maybe in the past, years ago before I, I got a little older, <laughs> I loved to jog. I just, I loved to jog. And I, I would still do it today if my ankles and knees and back would be okay. But I used to love to jog, you know, and then it was always like, go a little further, you know. 
uh, just maybe another hundred yards or another quarter mile or half a mile, whatever it be, and you know, and you'd be so tired and, and, and it's hurt, but but you know, I would make that effort because I wanted to go a little further. I wanted a little more of a goal to do, you know, and, and so you just plod on a little bit, you strain a little bit more to do. Athlete, athletes know, don't they, Brent? They know what it means to make an effort, extra effort. I mean, you know what it means to have effort. And so in the scriptures, he's saying to Christians, make every effort. Do you notice these words are important? Not just effort, but every effort. Now, understand this. When we're saying, when we ask God to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us, come in, we confess that, we accept Jesus, we're saying, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 reminds us, you're saved by grace through faith, not a words lest any man should boast. So we're saved by faith. But that is not all there is to it. It's, Christian is not just, I got saved, I'm going to go home, everything's fine and dandy. There are things that God wants us to do in our journey with him. In fact, the Apostle Paul said in the scriptures, work out your salvation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. God does his part to save us, to help us, to keep us, to put his Holy Spirit inside of us, to show us the way to go on. But there are parts that you and I need to do in our own journey. And this is one of them. That's why he's saying, you make every effort. You make every effort to add these to your faith. God's not going to add these to your faith. These are things you and I have to add to our faith. Why? Because he wants us to have a godly life. We started out in verse 3. He's given us everything for a godly life. But then we need to add these things to our journey with him. And he says it's through the knowledge of him. And so now it comes to the main intent of this epistle. To the main intent. And Peter now is wanting to, if you will, excite them, encourage them, and for us today, as the scriptures are applicable, that we might then add these things and put these things in our life and advance and grow these certain qualities or characteristics, if you will, to a godly life. Now, make every effort, every effort. And he says, if you do so, according to verse 8, in increasing measure. Now, here we go again. Add this to your faith. Make every effort to do this. Now you want, he wants you to increase it in measure. Increase it in measure. <clears throat> He's not talking about just, you know, having a little bit, but he wants you to increase it in measure. To increase something is to add more to it and to have more than you had when you started to it. To increase in measure. To make sure that you're going to have, oh, I'm, don't you love to hear that train whistle? <laughs> Because it's after 10 o'clock. Amen. And my wife and I talked about that coming down. So we haven't had a train for a while to keep us from coming to church and worship. And so we're, we're thankful when I heard that it's after 10 o'clock. But back to the message. Increasing in measure. So now he's saying, add, make every effort, and now increase these things that we're going to list as he gives us in the scriptures. Increase these in measure. So now he wants this to be more than there was before. If you're a real Christian, I don't know if that's a good word to use. Let me say, if you're really born again, if you're really saved, if you really have Christ Jesus in your heart and life, all these things are in your life. All these things, all these seven things are in your life. But what he's saying is, he wants you to add more of these. He wants you to increase in these things in your life so that you'll be productive and not unproductive, as we'll go down further in Scripture, because he says further down, if you add all these things in increasing measure, and that's a journey. Understand, that is something, if you're a believer, will happen to the rest of your life. This isn't something you get once or two, you want to buckle my shoe, three or four out the door, no. This is something that we are to add all the time in our lives. And some of these, as we get to the end of the message, I'm going to give an opportunity to come and pray about. Because if you're a normal human being, saved or unsaved, doesn't matter, there'll be some of these qualities that you need to improve on. Some of these that God will speak to you about and say, oh yeah, I think I need to add a little more of this one. I need to increase a little measure on this one in my faith and in my journey. And so the intent now is to encourage them to do this. And if you do, he says you'll be productive, so let's look at it. Now, I can't spend much time on each one in, in equal time, and some are put explanatory, 
And some will need a little more effort than others to understand, maybe, and deal with. But the first one he says is to add goodness. What? I hope that that's kind of explanatory. I, don't, I would think that goodness is something that comes from the heart. It means just living a good, decent, godly life. It's an action that says we need to increase in being good, living a godly, good life. Then the second one is knowledge. He said add knowledge. Now, this is important because you cannot know what's right and what you need to do unless you know what is right and what you need to do. And you can't know what's right and what you need to do unless you know God's word. This is what helps you understand what's right, what you need to do. You've heard me preach, I'm sure, time and time and time and time again. And time and time again. Everything is in here for you and I to know how to get saved, how to stay saved, keep saved. We, everything's in here to know how to be a, a, a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, a parent, a child. Everything's in here to know about finances, how to handle marriage relationship, how the church is supposed to be run. Everything's in here. And he's saying you need to add knowledge to your faith. Keep adding more knowledge. And the more you know of the scriptures, the more you know about God. And the more you know about God, the more godly you're going to be. Simple as can be. It's not great science. It's easy to understand. The more you know God's word, the more you know what God's saying, the more you're going to know what's right. And then you can do what's right. And the more you do that, the closer you get to God, and you become more godly. Amen? It's not hard to understand. Second one. This one we're going to spend a little time on. Self-control. Self-control. <laughs> Some of you are grinning already. Sometimes, even as Christians, we're not the best about having self-control, are we? So you need to add self-control. Self-control is that, that ability, that ability to, to keep our emotions and our actions in check that will please God. Um, I've been around this long enough to understand, and some of you, I'm sure, understand. Sometimes, even in the church, we don't see self-control sometimes. <laughs> Can't imagine that, Kevin. <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes things are said that shouldn't be said. Now, if you can't say amen, do like you did on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, my one my pastor used to say, if you can't say amen, say oh me. Yeah. But we need to have self-control with our actions. We need to have self-control with our thoughts. Now I'm not going to ask you to say amen or raise your hand, but I know the answer to this, or I wouldn't ask it, because I'm involved in it, we're all involved in it, doesn't matter how saved you are. All of us get thoughts that aren't good from time to time. All of us. That's the only way the devil can work on you. These, I call them dumb, stupid thoughts, you know. The older I get, sometimes it's worse than when I was younger. And I'm like, why go on? I said, well, because, you know, the devil's trying to get at you, you know, get closer to heaven, you know. And his only way he can do is work on giving you dumb thoughts, stupid thoughts, all kinds of dumb things. You know, sometimes even dumb dreams, stupid dreams. You know, you have, I'm sure you've had the dreams and you wake up and you know what the dream is. You stay awake so you don't go back and have the dream some more. It's like, how can you have this dream when you're awake? How's that dream you're only when you're sleeping? And somehow you're having the dreams while you're awake. Yes, yeah, so I love you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, and the apostles didn't Paul remind us again, bring all the thoughts in subjection to Christ. All the thoughts. We need self-control with our thoughts. When you have those thoughts, that are not right, we need to bring it in subjection to Christ. When we have our actions need to be in subjection to Christ. Our motives, everything needs to be in subjection to Christ. And, and our mouths need to be in subjection to Christ. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes we say, say things to our spouses, to our children, to our parents, to Christian friends, to wherever it might, that we wish we'd have never said. And you know the sad part is, once it's out, you can't bring it back. How many people get hurt by a loose mouth, loose cannon? And the scriptures remind us that we need to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Paul talked about this in Ephesians. 
in verse chapter 4 and verse 29, he says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Now, whatever you think unwholesome talk is, I'll let God help me with that. I can give you some thoughts, uh, but you wouldn't like it, maybe. So I'll just let God help you <laughs> with some awful talk. But he kind of explains a little bit. He says, but only that which is for building up of others. If you can't build somebody up with your mouth, keep it shut. I used to have a lady in my one church, her thing was zip it. Unwholesome talk. We need to have self control with, with our mouths. In Proverbs, another scripture he deals with in 18, chapter 21, he says, The tongue has the power of life and death. Can you imagine? The tongue has power of life and death. He reminds us over in the book of James. In chapter 3, he says, and he talks about horses and putting bits in the mouth so he can control them. I used to show horses, love horses, ride horses, and you know, that was the whole thing, man. You get that bit in their mouth, and you can stop them, you can back them up, you can rein them left, you can rein them right. You know, the animal, and he talks about the ship and how even a big ship, a little rudder can steer that. I, I, can't, I can't fathom that. Imagine some of these huge, humongous ships in the ocean. And a small little rudder just controlling, you know, that ship to where it goes. And so he goes on and he says, And likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small part, spark. And the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. And he goes on to talk about every animal can be tamed, but the tongue, the tongue, only God can control the tongue. But it is so important, you know, he, he talks again in James, the first chapter, and he talks about out of the mouth comes cursings and blessings. He said, this ought not to be. How can sweet water and bad water come out of the same stream? Good fruit and bad fruit out of the same, it can't happen. As a Christian, we really need to watch our mouths and what we say. Bad words, unwholesome words, stupid words, dumb things, self-control, we need self-control and ever before, I think, in our lives. Do you agree with me? Yeah. Amen. And then he goes on, he goes, and this one's in, in, important, especially in trial, and he says, and then add perseverance. Another word for perseverance is, is, is patience. And, and James 1, 4, he talks about it, and he says this, let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Uh, we are born into trouble in this world. If you haven't figured that out yet, uh, I don't know where your head's at. But we're all born into trouble in this world. What did Jesus say in John? In this world you'll have trouble. But be a good cheer of overcome the world. We're, we're born into trouble. Bad things happen to good people. I, I was encouraging Herb the other day and visiting him and we're talking about this very thing because some of you know, maybe if you don't pray for Herb, you've got colon cancer and uh, they're going to be giving him treatments. There's quite a shock, you know, quite a shock to go in and have tests and all of a sudden you got colon cancer. Uh, you know, we're going to give you radiation, check chemotherapy and hope that this arrests it or shrinks it or gets it down so we can, you know, cut it out and do all of that. And, we were talking about that, and others of you have gone through trouble. Everybody goes through trouble. If you haven't gone through them, you will. And if you've gone through them and got over them, you'll have them again. Now, that's not a good sales pitch, but it doesn't matter whether you're saved or unsaved. We are born in trouble. We live in a life full of trouble. There are financial problems. There are marital problems. There are communication problems. There are all kinds of problems we can have in our lives. Things just happen. That's a part of life. But the thing he's saying is add perseverance to your faith. Why? Because according to the scripture here, he was talking to James, because when you persevere and when you take it, and you take it and you take it and you trust God, you are going to get closer to God and closer to God. In fact, uh, you know, that's what Herb and I were talking, and I love what he said, and I, he doesn't mind me, I'm sure he's sharing this with you, because he said, you know, I believe this is drawing me closer to God. Two things happen when you go through problems. Two things. You either get closer to God or you get unhappy with God and turn away. That's, what, that's the way it works. 
Yeah, I've seen it my whole life. Two people in the same family can have a problem. One just grows closer to God, closer to God, and the other gets mad and angry at God and goes away. He's saying, add this to your faith. In increasing measure, add this. See, when we go through trials and troubles, uh, and we don't give up, and we don't give up, and we don't give up, and we trust, and we trust, and we don't murmur and complain. We need to add that. Now, people say, I'm not angry at God. You know, I'm not blaming God for this. And I'm saying, well, yeah, you are. Because if you're saying, I don't know why this would happen to me. What you're saying to God is, hey, God, you're in control of my life. Why did you let this happen to me? And sometimes as Christians, we do a little whining and a little complaining. <laughs> why Why that is my job? And why am I having a problem with it? Why didn't this work out like I thought it worked out? I had plans, you know, and it's just not working the way I thought it would work. And I don't understand, you know. And it's okay to talk to God. Don't misunderstand. It's okay. God wants us to say to him, help me understand this, Lord. I'm not real thrilled about this. But there's a distance between asking God and telling God how you feel and whining and murmuring all the time about, wah, 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 wah. I used to have a pastor with white friend. That was her thing. Wah, 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 wah. You know, uh, we used to have this. This is the world's smallest wild animal. Playing my hard space for you, kind of thing. It's okay to have a problem, but we need to add perseverance or patience so that we will grow. Because he said in the scripture, remember what he said? So that you will mature and grow in Christ. You see, if we add these things, every one of them, keep adding them to our life, we'll be productive. We'll live a godly life. We'll please God, and we won't be unproductive at all. Now, the fifth one is add godliness. Add godliness. Godliness, strange as it may sound to you, godliness is produced by trials and troubles when you persevere. Because the more you persevere, and the more you trust God, and the more you don't complain to God, and the more that you believe God, the closer you get to God. It's just, that's how it works. You get closer to God, and closer to God, and closer to God. And, and, and when the suffering, when we take it and choose to trust Him, we draw close, and when we draw close to God, you're going to live a God. You can't live close to God and not live a godly life. You can't live close to God and not be a godly life. Impossibility. Because the closer you are to Him, the more you love Him, the more He loves you. You know that. The more you grow together, you're going to live because you want to please Him. You're just going to naturally live a godly life. Number six, he says, is mutual affection. Add mutual affection. Now, all of these that we've listed so far, all of the other five, all of those bring us to a place of reverence and trust and fear in God. All of those. And when that happens, you have, if you will, they call it a mutual affection with God. There's an understanding. You and God are close now, closer, because you're adding these things in, and you're doing it in measure, increasing in measure. And that, as that happens, there's this, if you will, love relationship you have then with God. Because as you're trusting him in troubles, and you see how he brings you out of it, you get closer. And, and, and I guarantee you, I can't guarantee you a lot of things, but I guarantee you on the word of God that sooner or later, no matter what the trouble is, God's going to bring you out of it. How many of you have had some troubles in your life, whatever it is, it can be marital, financial, physical, financial, and it, and it was tough and it lasted for a while, but you can say now, looking back, God brought me out of it. Anybody? Most all of you can say, yeah, God brought me out of it, you know. And when that happens, you see, that there's that bond and like love relationship that's between you and Jesus. And it gets better because you've seen him work in your life. You've seen the answers to prayers. You've stayed faithful with God. Number seven. I thought last but not least, interesting how this would be the last one in the seventy list. Add love. Increase in measure and add love. Love for God first, the scripture says, then your neighbor as yourself. Now, if you're a believer, we are children of the same Father. If you're a believer, we are servants of the same Master. If you're a believer, 
we are members of the same family. You're a believer? We are travelers to the same country. If we're believers, we're the heir of the same inheritance. Therefore, therefore, and you notice in the scriptures down here, he uses the word therefore. Uh, us preachers, most every preacher I know always make sure we highlight that. Because when it says therefore, it means whatever I just told you. I just told you all these things. And he said, therefore, my brothers and sisters, here it comes in verse 10. Make every effort to confirm this cause. Make every effort. He starts out with make every effort. Add this increasing measure. Now at the end he's saying make every effort again. And to what? To love one another. You know, Jesus said in John, <coughs> excuse me, 1335, he says, by the love you have for each other, the world will know you're my disciples. I remember sharing that probably a year ago. I can remember saying this to you. Uh, again, I'll say it to you again. If you want people to believe that there's a God in heaven, if you want believe, people to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and if you want people to believe that you're really a Christian, how it's going to prove to them is you love other Christians. No, Jesus never said, by all the knowledge you have in the book, that's how people will know you're you're my disciples. He never said, by the church you were part of, that's how you'll, they'll know you're a Christian and you'll have disciples. You're part of the family. He didn't say, he didn't say, by the money you give, that's how people will know. He didn't say, he said, he said, by the love you have for one another, that's how the world will believe. One of the worst things that happens in churches, splits and troubles and problems, is because people aren't loving each other. I've seen it happen. Churches split, people fighting. People leave the church over over the years. I've seen it over somebody that said something stupid to them. They didn't keep the mouth in check. It must break the heart of God. My son, his job, and I'm not going to go into detail, but he really tries to witness, and most of them are all pretty much heathens. <laughs> That's a non Christian sentence. And the one guy in particular, Said, I used to go to your church, Todd. I used to go to your church. But years and years ago, there's a family in there that just about tore us up and run us out and hurt us. And they haven't been back for probably 30 or 40 years. That ought not to be. Amen? That ought not to be. Now, we can disagree and we will disagree. If you don't think of disagreement, you're not married. <laughs> Was that an amen? <laughs> or was that an old me? There was disagreement through the Bible and disagreements. We won't always agree in this church and leadership. We won't always agree on everything we want to do or not do. There's no way it's not humanly possible to agree on everything. But as my pastor used to say, we have to learn to agree to disagree without being disagreeable. Loving one another. Add this, he says, add this. Disagree. Don't always feel like everything is right. That's okay. That's a part of life. But if we want the world to believe and you want to see people coming into this facility that God has given us, whether it's your neighbors, your relatives, or acquaintances, or people you work with, they need to see you not bad enough in the church, not bad enough in Christian. They need to see your mouth in check and self-control. They need to see your actions in control. But they need more than anything in the world to see you love your brothers and sisters. Now, I'm not naive. Sometimes I am, but not on this. Some people are not as lovable as others. You've already got people in mind. And that's okay. But you need to love them. You need to love them. He said, add this. Add this. In increasing measure. And, and that takes effort. That's why at the end he said, make effort. it takes effort to love unloving people. It takes effort to love people who don't agree with you. It takes effort to love people who say bad things about you or do things to hurt you or discipline. It takes effort to love them. It takes effort. It's not an easy thing. This life of being a Christian, I hate to tell you, it's not an easy thing. If you're not saved, I know that's not a good sales pitch, but you need to understand. I mean, 
Jesus died a terrible death and you'd be saved. It wasn't an easy thing for him. Being a Christian is something we have to add and increase these things in our lives. That's why he says, you know, therefore, therefore, make every effort to confirm, make this thing solved. All these qualities, all these characteristics, all these values must be added if we're going to lead a godly life. And this, according to the scriptures, will glorify God when we live a godly life. And they will, they will, as we read on down in verses 8 through 11, they will keep you from stumbling. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted. So whoever's not adding these to their faith is nearsighted, he says. It's not my words, that's his words. And blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their past sins. That's why he says, therefore, therefore, knowing all this, Make every effort to confirm your calling. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble, and and you're going to receive, get this, a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Isn't that where we all want to go? Amen. Well, I do. So, but this takes effort. That's why he says, make every effort. Add it. Make an effort. Talking about being obedient, trustworthy, trusting, always moving forward. 